Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the possible resolution to the so-called faint young sun paradox. The idea that back in the days, billions of years ago, our sun was a lot cooler than it is today, which means that Earth should have been a lot colder and most likely would have been covered by ice entirely for billions of years. But we know this was not true. So how is it possible that with cooler sun, Earth could have still maintained its present temperatures? Or possibly even have temperatures that were much warmer than they are today? So let's discuss the recent discovery that scientists just identified and welcome to What The Math. Now, interestingly, you can simulate all of this in Universe Sandbox. If you run a simulation of the aging of a typical star, and you'll notice that with time, both the luminosity and the surface temperature of a typical star starts increasing quite dramatically. At some point, if you actually run this for billions of years, you'll start noticing the dramatic changes in size. Now, it doesn't go as far as making a, uh, an actual uh, supergiant, but it does get bigger and bigger, as you can see. So in other words, as the typical G-type star, which is our sun, ages, it slowly increases in both size and temperature. And of course, in luminosity, basically illuminating our planet with a lot more energy. Today, we believe that when the solar system was created, our planet Earth was probably receiving about 20 to 30 percent less uh, luminosity and thus energy. In other words, if you look at the modern solar system here, it's as if our sun was only about 70 percent as luminous as it is today. So here, if I actually change this right now, although it may not appear like anything changed, our sun is now a few hundred degrees cooler. And if you look at our planet Earth that orbits in the same location as it did originally, it will now start being covered with more and more ice until eventually it becomes really, really cold. So here we're actually not going to be getting as much heat anymore, and so the planet will slowly cool down, assuming we keep everything else the same, specifically the distance to the sun and other properties. Now, uh, I'm going to let this run for a few seconds while I explain to you what the modern science knows about the history of the solar system. So first of all, we don't think our planet changed its orbit too much. It may have been just a little bit closer because back then the sun was also a little bit more massive, so it had a little bit more gravity, and thus some of the planets were slightly closer, but not enough to influence the temperature that much. But this could be one of the potential explanations to this unusual paradox. Basically, how could you have liquid water on the planet if the sun was much cooler back then? This was originally proposed by the famous scientist Carl Sagan, but even today the explanation is not entirely clear, although the paper we're talking about today might present us with a pretty good solid uh, proof of what's happening here. So here's what our planet looks like now after only a few years, and it's getting colder and colder, and as you can see it's actually been covered by more and more ice. But so we have at least one more explanation. The sun could have had more mass and obviously um, produced a lot more energy, and so it's possible that the sun itself was actually emitting more energy simply because it was losing more mass. So even though its temperature and luminosity were kind of lower, basically it wasn't as bright as it is today, it was still emitting more energy overall because of the um, total mass loss. But this explanation is not really that well accepted. However, we have another explanation, and this one actually involves clouds. Clouds in general provide our planet with a bit of a reflectivity, so-called albedo effect. Today, the reflectivity of Earth is about 33%, so basically the clouds reflect some of the light back into space, cooling down our planet. But it's possible that billions of years ago, there were much, much less clouds decreasing the total albedo. And we can even simulate this here in Universe Sandbox by decreasing albedo directly, which will almost instantly start warming up the planet. It. So less clouds means less reflectivity and thus the planet becomes warmer. But this explanation doesn't really have a lot of proof, it's just an assumption. It's very difficult for us to establish how many clouds there really were. We know that clouds do actually form uh, more common when there's more cosmic rays, for example, but we don't really know how many more clouds would form, and also we currently can't really model or predict how many clouds used to exist around the planet back then. But the most well-accepted explanation is a much better explanation that is also related to today's paper. 
And the explanation is of course greenhouse gases. Now we know that some of the more potent gases like methane and water could have been responsible for certain warming effects like for example after a typical um, asteroid collision. But the gas we're going to be talking about is of course CO2. And specifically based on this study where they analyzed the actual samples from 2.7 billion years ago the scientists were able to establish that the carbon dioxide levels of our planet were dramatically higher. And just to give you a comparison, today the levels of CO2 on, on the planet are roughly around 0.04% of the entire atmosphere. We have about 20 something, 23% of oxygen, the vast majority is nitrogen, there's a lot of other gases like argon and so on, but CO2 is about 0.04%. And according to the scientists behind this paper who studied ancient micrometeorites that came from right here in some of the regions of Australia where a lot of meteorites are usually preserved and kept for a very long time, they were able to establish that it's very likely the levels back then were roughly around 70% of the entire atmosphere. And it actually makes a lot of sense. It makes sense that back then there was almost no oxygen because no bacteria produced it yet. And it's also very likely that the ancient atmosphere of our planet was a very inhospitable place with a lot of really extreme conditions. And one of these extreme conditions is of course high levels of carbon dioxide. Now luckily for us we can once again simulate these levels in a universe sandbox. And having increased the value to 70% this is what we kind of get. With the sun being only about 70% as luminous, the average temperature here is just a little bit lower than it is today. 11.5 degrees is about 4 degrees lower than the modern uh, average temperature. And as you can see, the Earth for the most part has a relatively similar uh, distribution of ice and liquid water as it does today. There's probably just a little bit more ice because the conditions here are just a little bit colder, but not enough for this to turn into an ice bowl. So in that sense, the scientists behind this paper are actually very likely correct in their assumption. The ultimate answer to the so-called faint young sun paradox is most likely a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere that allowed our planet to maintain these conditions. But so how exactly did they actually figure this out? Well, this is where it gets really interesting because we don't really have enough samples from back then to analyze the CO2 contents. Normally we use ice to discover this, but here we can't use ice because no ice is that old. Instead, the scientists use these tiny micrometeorites you see on the screen discovered in Australia. And a lot of these micrometeorites are very rich in iron. And the thing is, as they fall through the atmosphere of our planet, this iron starts interacting with oxygen inside the atmosphere and form this very specific compound known as woostite which sort of looks like this. Now, woostite can only be formed in some of the more extreme conditions such as rock that was hit by lightning or meteorites falling to the planet Earth. In other words, it's almost impossible for this compound to appear naturally on our planet without something major occurring. And when it comes to these micrometeorites, as they were falling through the atmosphere, the chemical reaction between the metal inside the meteorite and the oxygen present in the atmosphere of the planet started to create a lot of that material. But the thing is, to produce woostite, the oxygen doesn't have to come from oxygen itself. It can also come from CO2. CO2 has oxygen in it. And so the scientists behind this paper, they actually simulated a model where the falling meteorites were falling through various types of atmosphere, including atmosphere that was very highly enriched in CO2. And then they compared the result of the model with the actual samples discovered in Australia. And it just so happens that the one that matched the most with the samples was the model that had about 70% of CO2 in the atmosphere of early Earth. So in other words, it's very likely that this is exactly how the Earth was able to maintain warm conditions on the surface, which also means that the uh, actual atmosphere was very highly enriched in CO2 and possibly a few more other gases that we're not particularly certain about just now. Just to give you a comparison with Venus, uh, today Venus has about 97% of CO2 by mass, but it also has a lot more atmospheric pressure. Back then we don't think Earth was as high in atmospheric pressure, but right now we don't really know. Nevertheless, this discovery needs to be still confirmed, and once it is confirmed, if it's actually true, it means that we finally solve the decades-long paradox. We finally understand how Earth was able to maintain its warmth 
billions of years ago. And the thing is, figuring out how Earth looked back then when the life just started is really important for us because by being able to see ancient Earth and then possibly comparing this to some of the other thousands of exoplanets we've discovered so far, we might be able to find one exoplanet that resembles ancient Earth quite a lot. And in that case, this could be our primary search target for finding extraterrestrial or alien life somewhere out there except for planet Earth. In other words, if we can find a planet that looks like what Earth looked like back then, this might mean that we might be able to find life there. And even though it might not be intelligent life, alien life of any kind would be pretty exciting for us to discover. But until we find such a planet, or until we discover more about the history of Earth, that's really it. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Maybe consider supporting this channel on Patreon, because it does help me quite a lot. But either way, I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye. And meanwhile, let's see what happens if all of these planets collide into one another, and what's going to be created as a result. This is going to be a pretty interesting simulation, and it's very likely going to result in some sort of a major super-Earth. Let's see what happens. And, okay, I was wrong. Apparently everything got too hot and basically evaporated completely. We're now just stuck with a bunch of fragments flying through space. Well, that's unexpected. I kind of thought there would be a planet left.